In the pristine, icy environment of Antarctica, there's a telescope embedded into an ancient glacier. The telescope is observing the universe directly through the Earth using a cubic kilometer of ice to capture elusive particles called neutrinos. These ghost-like particles are streaming from the sun, coming from exploding stars millions of light years away, gamma ray bursts, colliding neutron stars, and black holes. And maybe, just maybe, it's going to be the instrument that finds dark matter. Welcome to Ice Cube. Actually, you're going to need to wait a few minutes before we talk about Ice Cube. First, we'll need to talk about the neutrino, the particle that Ice Cube was built to detect. It's a fascinating story and one huge mystery. Missing solar neutrinos it was only recently solved a few years ago. All right, let's get into it. Neutrinos are subatomic particles which are created as part of radioactive decay. They were first theorized back in the 1930s by scientists who were studying beta decay. This is when the nucleus of an atom has too many protons or neutrons. On their own, neutrons will decay away with a half-life of 10.5 minutes. And it's still not clear if isolated protons will ever decay. But when you have them together in the nucleus of an atom, protons can turn into neutrons and vice versa. When this happens, you get a blast of radiation and a cascade of other particles. Physicists studying this reaction were surprised that some of the expected energy coming out of these reactions was just missing. It didn't turn into electrons or photons of radiation, it just disappeared. The physicist Wolfgang Pauli theorized that some additional particles must be getting produced which have at most one one hundredth the mass of a proton. These could take away the additional missing energy and balance their physics equations. Physicists accepted the idea, but the neutrino defied detection. Although there were radioactive elements that should be producing these particles, they weren't concentrated enough for the detectors that researchers had available. In 1956, a team of American researchers used a nuclear reactor to generate an enormous number of neutrinos. Particles passed through a large water tank which contained newly discovered liquid scintillators. These produce a flash of light when struck by a high energy particle. Surrounding the tank were photomultipliers, which brightened up the flashes in the tank so that they were detectable by scientists. Over the course of several months, they detected an average rate of three neutrino events per hour. This demonstrated that neutrinos were a real thing and the team won a Nobel Prize for their discovery in 1995. It also demonstrated that neutrinos barely interact with any other objects they encounter. In fact, a neutrino on average can pass through a solid light year of lead without stopping. It's only when you have an enormous number of neutrinos passing through a huge volume of water surrounded by sensitive detectors that you can find them at all. Over the next few decades, physicists discovered other flavors of neutrinos. The original old school ones detected earlier were electron neutrinos. Then in the 1960s, physicists found the muon neutrino. Bang, another Nobel Prize in 1988. And finally, in the year 2000, physicists discovered the tau neutrino. But there's another source of neutrinos, and it's a big one, the sun. In fact, all stars are blasting out an incomprehensible number of neutrinos as a byproduct of their fusion reactions. At any moment, there are about 100 billion neutrinos passing through every cubic centimeter of your body. In 1967, a researcher named Raymond Davis Jr. was able to capture the first neutrinos from the sun in an enormous tank containing 375,000 liters of cleaning fluid. But there was a mystery. For some reason, the tank always detected just one third of the neutrinos that the theories predicted they would see. This was known as the solar neutrino problem. An even larger instrument, known as Kamiokande, was set up in an old zinc mine in Japan, deep underground, away from the interaction of cosmic rays. 
It started with a 3,000-ton tank in 1987 and was then upgraded to a much larger instrument in 1996, containing 50,000 tons of pure water surrounded by 13,000 light sensors. And a similar instrument called the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory is located 2,000 meters underground in Canada. Instead of regular water, it contains 1,000 tons of heavy water surrounded by almost 10,000 photomultiplier tubes. The advantage of these newer instruments is that they're capable of detecting roughly what direction the neutrinos are coming from, and this was the key to solving the solar neutrino problem. What they discovered was that when neutrinos are produced by the sun, they start out as the more easily detected electron neutrinos. But then, as they travel in space, they actually change flavor to the more difficult to find muon and tau neutrinos. The neutrinos weren't missing, they were there all along, they had just changed flavors along their journey. At this point, I've brought you up to speed on the state of neutrinos, and next, I'm going to talk about the Ice Cube Observatory in Antarctica. But first, I'd like to thank Oliver Durash, Richard Danes, Josh Schultz, Richard Ostick, Aaron, Gabor Zetskli, Misbeat, and the rest of our 837 patrons for their generous support. If you love what we're doing, you want to get in on the action, head over to patreon.com slash universe today. The Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory has got to be one of the strangest telescopes you've ever seen. Built on an enormous scale in one of the most remote and hostile places on Earth, every part of this instrument from the scale of its construction to its massive size to the catastrophic events it measures boggle the imagination. The instrument is located at the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station in Antarctica. You can't go any further south than this station. It's at an elevation of 2,835 meters on an ice sheet that's slowly drifting by about 10 meters each year. The first permanent station at the South Pole was built back in 1956 to participate in the International Geophysical Year, and the station has been inhabited ever since. As you learned earlier, neutrinos are best detected in enormous volumes of water. Wait long enough, and a neutrino will eventually crash into a molecule of water, releasing a cascade of other particles. Physicists had been building bigger and bigger tanks of water to make a more comprehensive search. And in 1995, an international collaboration began the ambitious project of turning a cubic kilometer of water molecules, a gigaton of incredibly clear Antarctic water ice, into the perfect neutrino detector, Ice Cube. They started with a series of tests to see if neutrino detecting instruments could be lowered down into the ice, starting with four strings to create the Antarctic Muon and Neutrino Detector Array, or AMANDA. They eventually upgraded it to 19 strings of detectors, proving that this technique worked well. In 2004, construction of the full Ice Cube Observatory began, drilling 60 centimeter holes and deploying strings of detectors down 2,450 meters into the ice. Drilling two and a half kilometers down is hard enough in the best conditions. Imagine how difficult it must have been at one of the most inhospitable places on Earth. The drill used a special high power hose and nozzle that blasted hot water, which melted the ice at a speed of two meters per minute. At this rate, they could generate a hole every two days or so. Then they would quickly deploy the strings of sensors and let the hole freeze up behind it, locking the instrument into the ice. Each year, during the Antarctic summer, the drill team was able to complete another dozen or so strings, taking a full seven years of construction. Finally, they had the full observatory with 86 separate strings of neutrino detectors sunk down into the ice. There are 5,160 separate digital optical modules embedded into the ice with photomultipliers. Whenever a particle strikes them, they send a signal back up the string that can be processed on the surface. The strings are denser in the center, providing more accuracy in the middle. When neutrinos passing through collide with water molecules, they release secondary charged particles. These emit Cherenkov radiation. And here's the coolest part. Neutrinos are moving almost the speed of light, no matter what they're moving through. But light only moves about 75% 
of its fastest speed through water. This creates a ripple of radiation that goes through the detectors that can be time sequenced. For the first time in the history of Neutrino Observatory, it's possible to accurately figure out the source of the neutrino in the first place. Did it come from the sun or just in supernova? Now astronomers can tell the difference. And this opens up an entirely new branch of observational astronomy. While photons of light are blocked by all kinds of things, atmospheres, rocks, dust, gas, cats, you, me, neutrinos pass right through all that stuff. At the highest energies, the cosmos is opaque to photons. But neutrinos can pass through it, no problem, giving astronomers a unique way to see the universe. As I'm sure you're anticipating, astronomers are figuring out how to make an even more sensitive detector. Their next plan is to build Ice Cube Gen 2, which will consist of 10 cubic kilometers of ice, 10 gigatons of ice. The current Ice Cube instrument would be surrounded by even more detection strings, spaced out even farther from each other. Once deployed, it would be sensitive enough to detect cosmogenic neutrinos. These are the neutrinos generated through collisions between ultra high energy cosmic rays and photons from the cosmic microwave background radiation. In other words, we could see a neutrino version of the cosmic microwave background, one of the most valuable tools astronomers have for studying the early universe. And as I mentioned in the introduction, Ice Cube could very well be the instrument that detects dark matter. Some models predict that neutrinos will occasionally crash into the particles of dark matter, releasing a very specific signal into Ice Cube. Physicists have already been able to rule out various models for dark matter and more observations, especially with Gen 2, could find that signal. The search for neutrinos is absolutely fascinating, and I love the idea of using the Earth itself as a scientific detector to search for these elusive particles. The current Ice Cube instrument is already really impressive, both in its scale and sensitivity, and the next generation will bring the very limits of the universe into focus using a particle that has defied our understanding for over half a century. What do you think? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Once a week, I gather up all my space news into a single email newsletter and send it out. It's got pictures, brief highlights about the story, and links so you can find out more. Go to universetoday.com newsletter to sign up. And all my videos are also available in handy audio and video podcast formats, so you can have our latest episodes show up right on your audio device. Go to universetoday.com slash audio or universetoday.com slash video to get the one you want, and I'll put the links in the show notes. And finally, here's a playlist.